In our last video, we took a look at what I call chapel ordinances, the symbols of chapel ordinances. Anciently in the tabernacle, it would have been the outer courtyard, the altar of sacrifice, the laver, what you and I find in our chapels today. But before we move into what is for you and I, the temple itself, I want to make four connections. I want to connect four other truths that I believe will help you see more in the symbols of the temple. Connection number one. We began this in our previous video. We took a look at our journey through mortality and that part of this life, we live in a telestial world. There is in this mortal life of ours, telestial portions all around us. It's like we have to make our way through a telestial room full of telestial things. And the question is, are you going to hold on to those telestial things? Are you going to stay in the room? Because you can't move on. You can't go into the terrestrial room and hold on to telestial things. So invitation number one was to let go of the telestial and come into at least a terrestrial world. Now may I suggest that the main purpose of temple and temple ordinances, temple covenants, is to invite us to get out of the terrestrial world and get into the celestial. I would suggest to you that all temple ordinances, the, the covenants, the ordinances, the symbols of the temple, are an invitation to come out of the terrestrial world and enter the celestial world. So we need to take a moment and talk about terrestrial sins. I think we're really good at identifying the natural man's tendencies. I think most of us could make a quick list of what's in the celestial room that I need to let go of in order to come into the terrestrial. And we see those emphasized in chapel ordinances. The killing of the natural man, the killing of the animal inside me, anger and violence and things that I know I shouldn't do. But what are terrestrial sins? If we're going to find meaning in the temple covenants, we need to understand the difference between terrestrial and celestial. That's a much more subtle difference. I think we're pretty familiar with the difference between telestial and terrestrial. Those are sins of action. Telestial people do something that terrestrial people don't do. That's an action. Or telestial people don't do something that terrestrial people do. It's a difference of action. One group does, one group doesn't do. Or one group doesn't do and one group does. As you transition from telestial to terrestrial, you're changing your behavior. Now the Savior invites us to get out of the telest terrestrial and come into the celestial. To better understand that transition, let's turn to the Sermon on the Mount. Let's specifically look at the Book of Mormon version of the Sermon on the Mount in 3rd Nephi, where we know there hasn't been any editing. There hasn't been any plain and precious truths lost. And I would suggest that if you look at the two records closely, if you look at Matthew chapter 5 and then 3rd Nephi chapter 12, you'll notice that the Matthew version jumps right into the Beatitudes, but the 3rd Nephi version includes two Beatitudes that aren't listed in Matthew. And I think that lets us know the audience. Who is the Savior speaking to in the Sermon on the Mount? So let's take a look at 3rd Nephi chapter 12 verse 1. The first Beatitude, he stretched forth his hand unto the multitude and cried unto them saying, Blessed are. There's the first Beatitude and one you only find in the Book of Mormon. Blessed are ye if ye shall give heed unto the words of these twelve whom I have chosen from among you to minister unto you and to be your servants. Blessed are those who listen to prophets, seers, and revelators. Now verse 2 is the second beatitude and I would suggest it sets the audience here. It tells us where is he speaking? What's the environment here? 
turning to the twelve, he says, Blessed are they who shall believe in your words and come down into the depths of humility and be baptized for they shall be visited with fire and with the Holy Ghost and shall re receive a remission of their sins. Now, do you understand then that the Sermon on the Mount is for those who have been baptized and his instructions are pushing them forward. So may I suggest that he's speaking to those who have come out of the celestial world. The Sermon on the Mount is the invitation to then take the next step. You've come out of the telestial world, now come out of the terrestrial and into the celestial. So with that setting, we can begin to see, okay, here's what got you here. Here's what got you out of the celestial and into the terrestrial. So let's just take a few of his teachings to kind of give us a better picture of what's in the terrestrial room that I need to let go of to get into the celestial. If this whole sermon is an invitation out of the terrestrial and into the celestial, then watch the pattern of what he's asking them to do. Let's take, for example, verses 21 and 22 of 3 Nephi 12. He says, what's got you here, the progress you've made is that you've heard that it has been said in old of time, thou shalt not kill. That was the get out of the celestial and into the terrestrial, the old law that thou shalt not kill. So I would suggest that violence and murder and harming people are very celestial in nature. When you harm people, you hit them, you cause them pain to murder and anything like unto it is celestial. Therefore, to not harm, to not hit, to not strike a child, to not cause harm to a human being, is terrestrial. And we see that kind of in our general society. It's good. Those are good people. Good people don't hit. Good people are not violent. You strike a child, I think we all recognize that that's the celestial act. To hit someone is a celestial act. And these people, these terrestrial people, don't do that. But now comes the invitation to get out of the terrestrial and into the celestial. So Jesus says in verse 22, But I say unto you, whosoever is angry with his brother shall be in danger of judgment, and whosoever shall call his brother Raka, or any derogatory name, shall be in danger of the council. If you call him a fool, you shall be in hell, danger of hellfire. So telestial people cause physical harm. They hurt, they murder, they strike, they hit, they're violent. Terrestrial people are not violent. Get out of the celestial and into the terrestrial. But now Jesus says, but do you hurt people with your words? Do you allow violence in your heart? Violence in my hand, I would suggest, is telestial. Violence in my heart and in my head and in my thoughts is terrestrial. To get out of the terrestrial world and into the celestial, I have to cleanse what's inside me. I have to let go of the anger in my heart and in my head. I have to let go of wanting to hurt you. Telestial people hurt. Terrestrial people want to but don't. Celestial people do not want to. They don't hurt with their words. They don't hurt with their eyes. They don't hurt inside themselves. They don't cause pain with what they feel and what they think. Terrestrial people to celestial people have changed the inner person. They've changed thoughts and attitudes. Do you begin to see that change? Now, celestial people don't do, terrestrial people don't do, but celestial people have changed an inner person. 
They've let go of anger and revenge and hatred inside. There's one example. Let's do another one. Later on in verse 27, Jesus says, the old law was thou shalt not commit adultery. And that was the transition from telestial to terrestrial. They don't commit adultery. So telestial people clearly do commit adultery. That's a telestial act. That's holding on to the telestial room. Violations of the law of chastity, physical violations of the law of chastity are telestial in their nature. To violate the law of chastity in action is a telestial act, and you're holding on to things in the telestial room. Now, to get out of that room, I will not violate that covenant physically. I will not commit the act of fornication or adultery or anything like it. Now comes the invitation into the celestial. Verse 28, he says, But I say unto you, Whosoever looketh upon a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery already in his heart. So eyes and heart. Celestial people do not think adultery. So committing adultery would be a telestial act. Thinking about it desiring it, fantasizing about it, is the terrestrial act. Therefore, the invitation into the celestial room is to cleanse my thoughts, to keep adultery out of my head and out of my heart. Do you see that difference? So you're beginning to see a pattern the difference between telestial and terrestrial is an action. It's an outer change. These people do, telestial does, terrestrial doesn't do. Or telestial doesn't do, and there's some act that terrestrial do. They pay their tithing. They don't pay their tithing. These people commit adultery. These people don't commit adultery. It's always a difference of action outward. But terrestrial to celestial is a desire. It's a thoughts in my head, desires in my heart. And if I want to make that change, I have to change what's inside me. Therefore, the washing that occurred, the, the laver in the Old Testament that was a washing, the baptismal font that washes the outside, and I am completely immersed in water, it washes the outside, is then replaced in the temple with a very specific washing. I have to wash my eyes not my outward, my inward. I have to wash my thoughts. I have to wash my heart. So think about that. How in the temple do we symbolically represent the washing of my heart? The washing of what I look at, what I think about, what I talk about, what I feel in my heart. That's the, that's the temple version. That's the invitation to change inside. In our chapels, we invite ourselves to change the outside. In our temples, we are invited to change our inside. Do you see that? Let's just do a couple more from the Sermon on the Mount. You'll see it in all of these, but just a few more. It is written, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. In other words, the only people I should do something negative towards are the people that have done something negative towards me. That's kind of a terrestrial way of living. It's equal. It's fair. You hurt me, I hurt you. But I don't hurt you for no reason. So I think what he's trying to suggest is telestial people, they just go about doing mean things. Terrestrial people will only do mean to you if you do mean to me. I will hurt you only if you hurt me. I will, I will retaliate. If you hit me, I hit you. 
And that seems to be equal. It's fair. It's you did to me, I did to you. Now, getting out of the terrestrial room and into the celestial means, but I say unto you, you shall not resist evil. Maybe a better translation, maybe a better idea in our culture would be, you don't return evil for evil. I'm not going to return evil when you do evil to me. That's a terrestrial act. If you spread a rumor about me, I'm going to spread a rumor about you. I'm going to do what you do to me. I'm going to love those who love me and hate those who hate me. That's fair. That's terrestrial. Celestial means I'm going to return good. I'm going to love you when you don't deserve my love, when you haven't earned it. Those are the moments I'm going to choose to love. It's easy to love when I'm being loved. It's not so easy to love when I'm not being loved. And hence the other one, Jesus says, love thy neighbor, hate thine enemy. That's terrestrial. Telestial people just hate everyone. They just only love themselves. Terrestrial people love those who love them hate those who hate them. So Jesus says in verse 44, but I say unto you, love your enemies. Or maybe otherwise, love the people when they don't deserve your love. It's the moment that someone who has hurt me, the some, someone, even maybe someone in my inner circle, it's the moment when someone doesn't love me that I get to express celestial love. Do you remember the parable of the sermon, uh, the good Samaritan? The Samaritan loved when love wasn't expected. No Samaritan was expected to take care of a Jew. The priest and the Levites didn't love when love was expected. That was particularly condemning. That wasn't even terrestrial. They didn't love when love was expected. But the Samaritan loved when love wasn't expected. And that's celestial love. It's to change me inner, in, inner. It's to change the inside of me. It's to change my heart, my thoughts. So think for a moment in the temple, if I have bad feelings towards you, I'm asked not to participate. I'm not living in a celestial manner. And I certainly can't go into the celestial room if I have bad feelings about you in my heart. Do you see the difference between telestial, terrestrial, and celestial? So the change from telestial to terrestrial is an outward. And the change from terrestrial to celestial is an inward. No one is able to see if I'm truly becoming a, a celestial person because that change is simply inside me. Only Heavenly Father and the Savior and the Holy Ghost know whether or not I am a celestial person. But to get more out of temple ordinances, I think we need to understand that every temple ordinance is pointing at that invitation to get out of terrestrial and into celestial. It's an invitation to change the inner person, the, to change my thoughts, my attitudes, my heart, not my behavior. Anything that points to behavior would be a reminder of getting out of the celestial room. But the invitation of the temple is to get out of the terrestrial room and into the Father's presence. And that is a require, that is a change of the, of what goes inside. So when I wash, I wash the inside of me. I'm not washing my body. I'm washing my thoughts, my words, my desires. So the first thing we're going to do in the temple is we're going to wash, but we're going to wash the inside of us. Do you see that change? 
All right, connection number two. Ordinances of the gospel consist of at least two portions. Ordinances consist of a token, some physical act we perform that is the symbol and the covenant, which is what we're promising. So a token and a covenant. This is what I'm promising and this is what I'm doing in the moment of the covenant so that I can symbolize what I'm promising. Therefore, to understand the covenant, we look at the symbolism of the token. This is why temple symbolism is so critical to understand. Because in my observation, quite often the Lord doesn't include the wording of the covenant. Sometimes He does and sometimes He doesn't. For example, in the prayer of the baptism, when we were baptized, the wording was, having been commissioned of Jesus Christ, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. That's the wording. There's no indication in that wording of what I'm promising when I was baptized. The wording doesn't include the covenant or the promise. Now, luckily in the sacrament it does. When we partake of the sacrament, which is a different token, but the same covenant. The Lord simply changed the token. Let's go from immersion to partaking, breaking bread and eating of it or drinking of a cup. But it's the same covenant we made when we were baptized. So he clarifies the covenant by changing, by looking at the token. Now, this time when we partake of the, the sacrament, he, the wording is included. So he says that we witness unto the Father that there, we are willing to take upon us his name and always remember him and keep his commandments which we, he has given them. So at least the wording includes a portion of the covenant. But even then, the covenant is much deeper than just those simple words. And so we need to look at the token what are we doing physically when we make the covenant that is an indicator of what I'm promising to do? So the token of baptism is immersion in the water. And so that's why we pointed out that it points to the death of the animal as we saw in the Old Testament. The death of the natural man, the death of the animal in me. I am promising to kill the natural man and come up a new person. Or I am promising to break my heart like we break the bread. I am promising to drink the Father's will even when I don't want to. So the token points to the covenant. So when you walk into the temple, you need to say, wait a minute, I'm, I'm making a promise here. He's not even drawing attention to the fact that I'm making a promise, but I need to understand that the promise is revealed in the token. So look at the symbolism of the token to understand what I'm promising. For example, if I wash my eyes, what's, what's the covenant? What does he seem to be asking me to promise to do when I wash my eyes, when my eyes are washed? And if you begin to play with that imager, you begin to realize that he's asking me to cleanse what I look at. I need to cleanse what I look at. I need to change the inner portion of me and I need to change my desires to look at inappropriate material. Clearly, I'm not going to do it because that would be telestial, but I need to not desire even looking at it. Do you see how the token points to a covenant? So in every one of these symbols, the token, which is the symbolic act, is teaching the covenant. That's point number two. Now connection number three. 
when the, Lord, when the Lord first commanded the building of a temple, He used some very specific words. And then when we dedicated the temple, He turned those words. And I would suggest that that act is symbolic of what temples are inviting us to do. I find this so significant in understanding the covenants and the ordinances of the temple. Let's jump to Doctrine and Covenants section 88 verse 119 where the Lord first invited them to build a temple. He didn't say build a temple. He said organize yourselves, prepare every needful thing, and establish a house. And then he listed it from a different point of view, a house of prayer, a house of fasting, a house of faith, a house of learning. But I want to focus on those three verbs. He said to me, organize, prepare, and establish. Now I want to focus on the, the verbs, organize, prepare, and establish. Notice the Lord was asking us to organize, prepare, and establish. That's what we needed to do. As a people, we needed to organize ourselves in order to build a temple. And as an individual, before I entered the temple for the first time, I needed to organize my life. There were some things I needed to organize. I needed to prepare. I needed to establish. So clearly the Lord is telling us to do that, organize, prepare, and establish. But now we're going to turn to the dedicatory prayer of the Kirtland Temple that was given to Joseph. So these words were written by the Father, almost as if he's saying, you don't fully understand temple ordinances, so let me give you the words to pray in the dedication. But notice what he does with each one of those verbs. Section 88, he told me to organize. Doctrine and Covenants section 109, the dedicatory prayer of the Kirtland Temple, he says that if I go into the temple, I will be organized. So if I organize, I will be organized. One of the most significant things that ever happened in my entire life is because I organized my life, because Jen and I organized our lives, we went into his house and he organized the two of us into an eternal family. He organized an eternal family because we organized ourselves. He says the same, he's, he does the same with prepare. Notice in verse 15 again, if we go into the temple, we will be prepared to obtain every needful thing. So I was supposed to prepare every needful thing so that he can prepare me and I can be prepared. Do you see that? I do, he does. I organized, he organized. I prepared, he prepares. If I prepared everything, I will be prepared to receive everything. And the last one was establish. Again in section 109, Joseph Smith was asked to ask the Lord to establish the people that shall worship and honorably hold a name and standing in this thy house to all generations for etern and for eternity, that no weapon formed against them shall prosper. And he who diggeth a pit for them shall fall into the same himself, that no combination of wickedness shall have power to rise up and prevail over thy people, upon whom thy name shall be put in this house. In other words, Father, establish the people who come to the temple. But he had previously told us to establish the temple. That to me is one of the most eye-opening insights into temple covenants. They have two components. And if I only see the one component, I've missed a portion of the temple. If I only see that he is doing something, but I don't connect that to what he's inviting me to do, I've missed it. Every ordinance, every covenant, everything we do in the temple has that dual invitation. I do and he does. And we often use the same token. So, for example, 
if I wash what I look at, he will wash what I see. Do you see that beautiful connection? I have to look at different things. I have to wash what I look at and wash away the dirt. If I wash what I look at, he will wash my eyes so that I can see. We saw this in the Old Testament in the book of Moses where Enoch was told. Let's read it. Moses chapter 6 in verse 35. This is Enoch's portion. The Lord tells Enoch, anoint thine eyes with clay and wash them and thou shalt see. So you wash what's in your eyes, Enoch. And when he did that, look at verse 36. The Lord washed his eyes so that he could see. And he beheld the spirits that God had created and he beheld also things which were not visible to the natural eye. Because Enoch washed what he was looking at, the Lord washed what he saw. So see that in every aspect, see that in every ordinance. If I wash my head, if I wash what I think about, he will wash what I understand. If I wash my desires, he will wash what I feel. Do you see that? Prepare, be prepared. Organize, be organized. Establish, be established. Every ordinance has a portion that I do and that he does. If I want him to anoint me, then I need to anoint myself. If I put a mark on myself, then he puts a mark on me. Every ordinance has that dual relationship. What am I doing and what is he doing? Think about, for example, the law of consecration. If I am willing to give God all that I possess, then God is willing to give me all that he possesses. Do you see that dual nature? Connection number four, let's get into the temple appropriately prepared to see the image. Do you remember where we left off in the chapel, the death of the natural man, the burial of the natural man? In our modern chapels, we do it through baptismal font. We go down and again enter a womb where we are born again. We come out of that water like we came out in birth, a new person. So the symbolism is the chapel covenants have resulted in you being reborn. You are a newborn again. Just like when we came out of our mother's womb, coming out of the chapel, coming out of the womb again, we're that image. So going into the temple, we are this. We are a newborn baby. We have been born again. That's the death of the natural man and the rebirth of us. We have been born again. Now take a look at this baby. What's the first thing we're going to do to this baby coming out of the womb? We're going to wash him or her. Therefore, what would you expect to be the very first ordinance in the temple? A washing. The first thing you do to a newborn baby is you wash them. Now, if this newborn baby were, for example, Simba, what happened the moment Simba was born? What happens the moment a future king is born? He's anointed. So first we wash and then we're going to anoint the future queen, the future king. And then what would you do to a newborn baby? You clothe them. You put clothing on them. You're going to take that baby, wash him up, and then wrap him in new clothing. 
Hence, what do you expect to see in the temple? A washing, an anointing, and a clothing. And then tell me what this baby needs. What else are we going to do to a newborn baby? Usually before you leave the hospital. My wife and I always did it before we left the hospital. We named him or her. We gave the baby a name. So do you see the symbolism of coming out of the chapel? We are reborn. We are this baby needing to be washed, clothed, anointed, and named. So we're now going to look at the symbolism of washing, which I think we've kind of done in this video. We'll probably jump right to anointing and then clothing and then receiving a name, the symbolism of being clothed, being anointed, and receiving a name. So come back, but I wanted to make those four connections. Number one, the temple is pointing us from terrestrial to celestial. Number two, ordinances have two pieces, a covenant and a token. Understand the covenant by seeing the symbolism of the token. Number three, Prepare and be prepared. And number four, see the symbolism of that newborn baby as we go into the temple. Wash him, anoint him, clothe him or her, and name them. See you next time.